right. Welcome back, everybody. Next up, please welcome Steve, who will be speaking about Easy Pake Oven. Uh, I'm Steve. You may know me as Scoobs. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, so, a quick overview of louder. Thank you. Uh, quick overview of my talk. It's going to be, you know, uh, what, why, which, password, KDFs, APIs, and HSM's uh, secret salt and recovery. So, what is a pake? Uh, pake is a password key. Uh, <laughs> This always happens in like the first five minutes. I always get super nervous. I know, uh, anyways. Woo! <laughs> anyway, so a password authenticated key exchange is just that. It's a key exchange that has a password involved such that anyone, um, uh, trying to do any like malicious attacks or anything like that, uh, gains nothing from it. Uh, it's a zero knowledge proof and the only thing that leaks is yes or no for whether your password was correct or wrong. Um, it also has, uh, there's um, two different types of pakes, um, balanced and unbalanced, sometimes it's called symmetric and asymmetric or augmented. Um, so a balanced uh, pake is where uh, it's peer to peer. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, so a balanced pake is where uh, you're peer to peer. So this is like um, two people that have a shared uh, low entropy key, such as like a, a short password or something that you prearranged or whatever. Uh, you can do a key exchange and uh, it can be secure. Uh, the other way, the uh, augmented, asymmetric, unbalanced way, is uh, server client. So the server has a password, and the the client has a password, and the server has a verifier. That uh, so the verifier it can't be used as a uh, way to authenticate to the server. So if the database ever leaks that verifier data can't be used to authenticate to the server, but uh, basically it's a password hash equivalent, but not a password equivalent. Uh, so why should you use Pake? Well, uh, it may seem uh, overly complex or scary or something, but there are some use cases where uh, it helps with uh, security. Uh, <coughs> So uh, one of these cases is recently, uh, over the last over a span of about a year, um, these tech companies accidentally were logging passwords, and if the password is never sent to the server, then uh, you can't log the password. Um, you might think, oh, I could hash the password first and send it over, but um, so you secure the database really well, but you still log like a simple hash of the password, and that's in the log. Those can be cracked easily. But uh, even if you logged all the pake data that's being going uh, that's going back and forth, um, you would gain nothing from that as an attacker. Um, uh, there, uh, since uh, this isn't like implemented in the browser, it would have to be uh, you'd have to implement it in JavaScript. And sometimes people have JavaScript disabled, so you'd have to still have a fallback, but that's, you know, uh, like 1% of uh, So some other uses, uh, as I was saying, peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer, uh, what you can do is uh, secure peer-to-peer -peer file transfer with uh, magic wormhole. Uh, you can also, uh, so that's the uh, GitHub uh, page for it, uh, you can also, it's in uh, package managers for Linux. Uh, I actually don't know which ones, but. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, anyway, so basically what it does is you have this uh, small uh, uh, shared secret 
that you send, uh, that you tell someone, they type it in, and then you can get a secure connection between the two of you, assuming that someone didn't man the middle and guess what it was with one try. Um, another good thing uh, picks are for are for encrypted cloud services like password managers and uh, encrypted backups because they have to do authentication and encryption with your password and there's a lot of things that you can do incorrectly with passwords, such as, so uh, there's downgrade attacks that uh, PAKES prevent. So a bug that um, LastPass had was you would log in, it would say error, well, if the server was compromised, uh, the server could reply with error iterations one, uh, you would be like, oh, oops, I had the iterations wrong. So then you would do one iteration, which would be a really fast hash, and then send that, and then it would say error iterations, the correct amount of iterations for your account. That, and all the user would see is that it took twice as long to log in. And they'd just be like, internet slow. Um, then there was Keeper. Uh, this was uh, on full disclosure. <clears throat> and uh, so the bug here was um, so the uh, way authentication and encryption worked on this is there was a salt and iteration count for uh, the authentication key and then there was a salt and iteration count for the encryption key, and both of those were run through PBKDF2, and then you would get the authentication key or encryption key, but if you sent the, if an evil server sent the encryption salt and iteration count for the uh, authentication stage, uh, the client would just send the encryption key. So that would be really bad. Um, I forgot which way I decided on doing this. <laughs> um, so the fix, well, so they don't like people not, oh, not praising them, so I'm not gonna say this one. Uh, but it was very obvious from the previous slide what they're doing wrong, because uh, they're doing exactly the same thing except for the authentication key is now hashed. So you can probably figure out what's wrong. Um, but if any, uh, well, I guess I'm still, uh, if they were using PAKES um, for authentication, then none of these uh, attacks would work. So uh, there's a bunch of PAKES, and which one do you use? So uh, you may have heard recently about uh, Dragonfly and uh, the Pony Award for Dragon Blood. Um, so uh, basically, uh, it was a timing attack on their hash to point algorithm because it was like an iterated loop which would then leak information. Uh, this was actually known to be bad uh, a while ago. I don't know why anyone uses Dragonfly. I guess their marketing team's good or something. but. Um, uh, uh, no one's actually done uh, a real life test on such as with uh, Dragon Blood, which is the cool part. Uh, anyway, so there's uh, SRP 6A. <clears throat> uh, so the clients on the left, uh, servers on the right, and those are just the arrows are just packets going back and forth uh, when the when you see a key, that means uh, at that stage, um, the that side can encrypt or send, well, and send um, the uh, authentication key, or yeah, the verifier thing. So um, you only need to um, authenticate the user, and uh, such as like logging into uh, an account, uh, then it would, you wouldn't need to do the last step. Um, there's, uh, so there, the, uh, on the server side, the, in, the key is actually available after the first packet, but 
if you send encrypted data or you or send the authentication token from the server to the client, um, the client actually has all the information necessary to do offline brute force. So if you were to do that, um, your implementation would be really, really bad. So uh, when I was doing my slides, I remembered seeing something weird on Wikipedia like a year ago and being like, wait a minute, this is wrong. <laughs> so um, I haven't actually had time to fix this, but uh, according to this, um, you can skip M1, which is the uh, authentication method, uh, ver uh, verification from the client to the server, and M2 is verification from the server to the client. Uh, if you skip M1 or, well, if you skip M1 and M2, and then you encrypt data to the client before verifying the encrypted data from the client, then the client has everything it needs to uh, do a offline uh, password cracking. So uh, opaque, that's the uh, new hotness. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Uh, uh, this PAKE um, was presented at uh, Real World Crypto a few years ago. Um, so what they introduced was um, uh, blind salt. It has this interesting property. So with other PAKEs, uh, the salt is given to the client or, you know, uh, assumed or whatever. Uh, and, you know, like... Uh, when I say assumed, I mean like the username combined with the uh, domain name, that's the salt. Uh, so uh, what happens with these other pakes is you can run the password KDF, which is uh, expensive, on a bunch of password guesses, and then, uh, so you store all that, all those keys, and then when you want to, what you do is, you well, once you're done with enough, you go and break into the server, grab the verification data, you can run through all of those passwords extremely fast. So if you are in a limited time scale from when you get in to when they're gonna change passwords or something, uh, you would wanna do this. That's like a theoretical attack. But with opaque, with the blind salt, um, there's, uh, Basically, it prevents that by, uh, well, actually. Uh, so you don't really have to read this. It's just sort of there, but. Um, so this is how blind salt works. Um, basically, uh, after it runs through, uh, if you had the wrong password at the beginning, so H, that's a fast hash. That's not like a password KDF or anything. Um, there's no information linkage on this. There's no way to, you know, from the client's message to know, oh, hey, uh, the password could have been like this, that or something. Um, but uh, so if the password's wrong at the beginning, then when you get back your blind salt, it'll be the wrong salt. And then when you're doing the password KDF, it'd be also wrong. So basically you have to do this all fine. Um, there is one small thing with, uh, so the, the S column, or, okay, you can't really see that. Um, so, uh, so server, the part where that's doing its work, um, if you're doing that with elliptic curves, um, basically what's happening is the server is receiving a point and then applying a private value to that, the same private value every single time, and what, uh, you can do with that is um, if there's a implementation error such as uh, this one implementation had a, a rare uh, carry bug and uh, Sean and Filippo uh, <clears throat> uh, they uh, did a black hat talk about uh, breaking that uh, they were able to 
So every now and then, given a point, it would uh, cause an error, and when the value was incorrect, they could then determine some information about the private key. They were able to recover the entire private key. And so if the uh, secret, uh, the server's salt is ever leaked in, in a case like that, then um, it would completely break opaque because uh, that would give you all the data as an attacker to do line password cracking. So, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> SPEG2 plus EE with blind salt, whew, that's a mouthful. So, uh, basically what I did was uh, I added blind salt to S uh, SPEG2 plus EE and I ended up sh uh, making the name smaller to uh, bspec or bspec. Um, basically, uh, it's similar to uh, the round trips. Well, it is the same as the round trips for uh, SRP, <coughs> except for this has an extra property that not many uh, pakes have. Well, it also has the property that opaque has where uh, it prevents pre-computations. Um, so this also has a property that is fairly interesting. Uh, so it's sort of quantum resistant. I call it quantum annoying. It's not really a quantum easy problem. It's not really a quantum hard problem. Uh, basically, um, most pakes you have to solve one DLP and then you uh, then you can do offline classical computer um, uh, password guessing. But with uh, bspec, uh, you have to uh, solve one DLP for every password guess. So uh, it's fairly expensive because um, even if we did have quantum computers, oh, I forgot to look this up. Uh, there's this paper that tells you, uh, like how many op uh, quantum operations you have to do to solve a DLP for, uh, a 256 bit elliptic curve, which it was on the order of a few billion. So even if you could do, if your quantum computer, theoretical quantum computer could do, a billion quantum operations per second, you're looking at, you know, 0.1 passwords per second with a very expensive computer. Um, there is a PQ PAC. Um, I haven't actually looked into it that much, but um, basically with uh, post-quantum algorithms, uh, we don't really trust them that well yet, so we usually run them in parallel with classical uh, cryptography, like elliptic curves and whatnot. And so with a PAKE, you can't really run a PQ PAKE next to a, uh, uh, BS PAKE, um, because you wouldn't get, uh, the combination, uh, it'd be whichever is the weakest one. Um, so basically, uh, I think the best PAKE to use is, bspec. Um, so this brings us to uh, password KDFs. So there's many different ones. Uh, one that you probably have heard of, or most common probably, uh, is just computationally hard. It's called PBKDF2. Uh, there's just one small problem with it. Uh, it has a foot gun. Um, so it runs in iterations times output length. So if you ask for, um, so if you're doing PPKDF2, uh, HMAC, SHA-256, each block of output of SHA-256 is 256 bits. So if you ask for 256 bits of key, then you only do iterations amount of work. But if you ask for 257 bits, then it has to do two blocks and thus it uh, needs to do twice as many twice as much work. Um, so 
uh, one password, uh, they generated a uh, uh, an IV and a key from uh, PBKDF2, and, they, and an attacker only needed to generate one of those blocks and uh, decrypt some stuff. And uh, it was uh, Adam from Hashcat that found that. And then uh, technically Google Sync isn't <laughs> on this list, but I like bringing them up because uh, it, uh, they did fairly bad. Uh, basically for Google Sync, they use Nigori, which um, the first thing that they do is they use PBKDF2 on constant data to uh, generate assault, then they do three more uh, runs of PBKDF2 to generate three different keys. Technically, they could have done PBKDF2 with just like a long out, which is kind of like what the foot gun would have done. But, uh, and then Microsoft, uh, the, the uh, they were using was SHA-1 based, so 160 bits, and they were asking for, or they were storing uh, 256 bits, so the their servers had to do twice as much uh, calculations as an attacker would have to. But, good thing, uh, each block of output is independently generated. So, use the foot gun to actually make PBKDF2 better, because what they're doing is each block is independently generated, so you, you can use uh, uh, SIMD, which is single instruction multiple data. Like, uh, so with x86, you have um, SSC2, AVX, AVX2, AVX512. AVX512, that can run uh, 16 uh, iterations of PBKDF2 uh, SHA-256 at the same time. So it would be 16 times more work being done in the same amount of time, and then you have multiple cores, so you can make PBKDF a little bit better, but still other algorithms are better. Um, you really shouldn't be using S-Crypt at this point because of the time memory trade-off. Uh, basically, uh, an attacker is the only one that actually uses this, um, to their advantage because they use less memory and they do a little bit more work. And uh, it ends up being faster overall. Then, uh, so instead you should be using Argon 2, but the problem with Argon 2 is um, for short runs for like authentication, uh, you can't use enough memory, it's just too slow. Uh, so, um, Technically, a better, al a better algorithm would be uh, a cache hard algorithm. Um, Bcrypt isn't actually a, a KDF, but there are like some weird ones like PBKDF, Bcrypt, or whatever. Um, and then there's also Pufferfish. There are issues, but whatever. Um, really, uh, I would say. Currently, Argon 2 would probably be the ideal way to go. Uh, so, with uh, <clears throat> so the problem with PIC APIs is uh, so this is what you usually see when you see an implementation of uh, SRP. So, calculate B, calculate M2, what's V? And, you know, so basically the developer has to figure out what all these are, and then they're like, okay, um, and some implementations uh, leave it up to the developer to figure out whether they're, how they're supposed to check M1, M2, which one they send first, and whatnot. And as I said before with SP, uh, SRP, um, this can lead to uh, very bad bugs. So a good API would be one that is easy to use and hard to misuse. So uh, basically, you start, you say who you are, who the other person is, and your secret. If you're a client or you know it's a symmetric pick, uh, this would be a password. If you're the server, then this would be your server secret data. 
then you say, uh, you let the API know what type of user you are and what type of mode you're using. And it will return a message, uh, a status. You check the status for whatever, and uh, the message, uh, you may or may not get a message back. If you do, you send it to the other, uh, other side. Uh, then, uh, so when you receive a message, you pass it into receive message. And then you get another message and a status, and as every time you get a message, you send it to the other side, and you check to see if you're finished by the status. And then uh, there's certain other things that you can do, like get key, get server secret, get uh, user key. So user key is um, a little bit different. Uh, it's kinda unrelated to PAKES, but so you're supposed to only run the, PB, uh, the password KDF once and derive two keys from it an authentication key and an encryption key. And since uh, we're using uh, blind salt and we can't generate two keys beforehand and give it to the API, uh, we have the API run the password KDF. Uh, if you need a user key, which is user specific based on the password to encrypt data that only the user can read. So, you know, like a password vault or a uh, you know encrypted backup or something. So you know uh, what client server. Uh, so those are for augmented and then uh, Alice Bob. Uh, so there are some pakes where you have to say I'm Alice, they're Bob, and vice versa, or uh, you can say I'm either Alice or Bob, and the pake figures it. Out. Then mode uses you, uh, you know, you're using the pake, and then uh, register, that just generates the server, uh, gets uh, sent to the server. Then the other two are special, uh, for a special case that we'll talk about later. <coughs> uh, you know, so these are just the flags. Session key available, that means you can encrypt, so that's there, then you can get the session key and then start encrypting data to the other side. Server secret available, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, verified other, you know, you've, you um, have already authenticated the other party, so in the event that like uh, uh, you only wanna verify the user, you could stop right then because if you're the server, because uh, you, that's the whole entire goal, is to just verify that the user's password's correct. So, fairly straightforward. Uh, so this is just, uh, so Carol, client, Steve, server. Hey, that's me. Uh, those are actually common, uh, the common names that are used for uh, describing client and user, or just like, you know, Alice, Bob, no. Uh, so, fairly easy. Um, so, uh, the server doesn't have a server secret yet because it's on register, so null. And, you know, for using, fairly straightforward. The common, this is for using or, um, it's all pseudocode, but uh, for using or, um, registering because all you're doing is waiting until it's finished or errored out and then you're just passing messages back and forth. Uh, yeah. Wait. There we go. So, uh, um, wait, okay. Uh, so, uh, basically what you can do as a server is you can have an HSM that store, uh, that has, uh, that you give it encrypted data, and what it does is it does the whole PAKE algorithm um, on, it, on its own, so that uh, if your database ever gets leaked, then 
the uh, uh, an attacker wouldn't have the decryption key necessary to uh, decrypt the verifying data, and <clears throat> they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, crack any passwords. So the way it would work is uh, so the client is on the far left uh, out of the picture. When the rows go that way, that's basically so. Finds the user, gets the encrypted data, sends it to the uh, the HSM, decrypts it, and then it has the server secret data, which then it runs the PAKE and gets a session key. Then uh, this this is actually a slide from another talk that I gave uh, a few years ago um, at B sides. So uh, this was for. Um, when you have like an encrypted service, so you would have an encrypted master key so that when you change your password, um, you didn't have to re encrypt everything. So, uh, what some does is it encrypts the uh, master key with the session key, sends that over to the client. No one in between the, uh, the HSM and the client can read these packets because of the PAKE session. And then a little bonus feature is you can derive a second key from the session key or a, another session key from the uh, session key and give that to the server so that they can uh, talk to the client in a way such that no one in between the server and the client can man in the middle of that without uh, knowing the password. Uh, so secret salt. Uh, so this is used by, um, well, they call it something else. They changed the name a few times. Uh, this is used by 1Password. <laughs> uh, so what this allows you to do is it's basically a key that's on your device and you never send it to the server or anything like that. Uh, and you basically transfer it to all your devices um, some way and then uh, what it does is it makes it so that um, an attacker would have to get your device, get the secret salt, and then they can then do online password guessing uh, to the server. Um, which means that if it was in like a password manager, uh, it would be actually more secure than a offline password manager. Um, all right. So uh, there is one small thing about 1Password. <laughs> um, so they require you to use a uh, their web client, which means if their servers are ever um, attacked or you know uh, infiltrated, then when you do use the web client. Uh, then they can extract, uh, send malicious JavaScript, which then can extract your key, which would be bad. Um, but uh, that's only uh, during administration because uh, that's not actually implemented in any of the uh, uh, apps that they have. Uh, so. Uh, recovering a lost secret salt. Um, I wrote a blog post about it. Uh, you can actually just go to tob2.com slash blog. Uh, you don't need to rest. Uh, I was lazy and it's just like, uh, uh, you can, uh, it's just directories. <laughs> so, um, so to the basic idea behind recovering a secret salt, um, if you ever lose the secret salt, then uh, you're screwed. Uh, e even though you know your password, you just can't uh, log in. And this would be really bad for users, which is why you need to make paper copies, which they won't make, and what. But so, tech making a recovery option for uh, secret salt would 
invalidate the entire idea of having a secret salt, except um, there's this little trick. Uh, so when you're doing, uh, so the recovery method is you do the password KDF with the bl uh, with another blind salt and <coughs> your password and this guessing salt. It's like 16 bits and what you do is after you run the password KDF, you throw away those 16 bits and what you have to do from then is you have to, when you're recovering, you have to brute force those 16 bits that you don't know. So if you ran a password KDF that was argon2 with like 256 meg, one, uh, one thread, three iterations, uh, it would run for about one second on your computer, so be like 18 hours, you probably a few less bits than that so that it would run in a uh, more reasonable amount of time, like a couple hours. Uh, the thing is, uh, you never actually, you're rarely ever doing this, so um, from the user standpoint, uh, it's I never get my account back or I have to do two hours of hard computations on my computer. And since uh, it takes, um, you know, two hours for one password guess, if a password cracker got this, that is a ridiculously slow speed. Um, so, the, uh, well, the, uh, so, the recovery method also uses opaque and whatnot, but um, uh, that's what those two extra ones were, the blind salt, so you would uh, actually do, do uh, wait, boop, there we go. So uh, these two, uh, blind salt, only blind salt, you would do that with your password and then you would get back your blind salt, then you would go, uh, do your, uh, basically brute force the guessing salt, and then after that you, uh, you would have a bunch of candidates which you would then use, uh, use after blind salt. Uh, you're also given a, a very short, a smaller hash than the guessing salt, so you'll have a, a few, uh, you know, like 10 or whatever, um, that you would have to do, uh, uh, pay operations with the server to then, then you would have a session key and then you would decrypt the, uh, the uh, secret salt that you lost and then you would have it back. Oh. Uh, questions? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'm slowly making my way up to the front. Can, you, oh, can, can, we, can we have this with the mic, please? I'll be right there. Thanks. Sorry, I walked in late, so I missed what a blind salt is. A what? I missed what a blind salt is. Oh. I walked in. Sorry. There we go. So uh, basically, blind salt uh, prevents pre-computational attacks. Um, it was uh, first added into a, a PAKE with opaque. Um, so basically with this, uh, um, so basically uh, after you run through this, uh, if you had the wrong password, you have the wrong salt for when you run your password KDF and there's no information leakage uh, in the algorithm, so you can't, uh, like, guess or whatnot what the password was from the server side. And uh, this makes it so that you have to do online password guessing. Hi. Uh, well, thanks for doing this talk, Steve. I, I, I think pakes are definitely underutilized and the landscape is definitely kind of confusing. So uh, <laughs> have you thought about contributing an implementation of your API to something like LibSodium just to make it easier for developers? Um, so uh, 
the nice thing is you can actually, you don't really have to write much. Uh, you just have to write the, uh, basically like a wrapper for uh, current implementation. Uh, what uh, project did you say? A uh, uh, libsodium? Or you know, oh. just any other general crypto library. Uh, yeah. Um, I did uh, t uh, talk to, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, the libsodium guy. Oh, Fred. Uh, Frederick, yeah, Fredericks. Um, uh, he, he, he didn't like it, so. What? He said he didn't like it. No, he, he didn't like it. But, you know. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, could you repeat again um, how opaque and BSpaque compare, like, how are they um, okay. different? So, um, opaque, uh, basically, so with opaque, it's fragile for implementations because of the uh, blind salt. Uh, basically, if you solve that DLP or figure out, you know, like what the salt is through some uh, coding error, uh, like uh, the carry propagation, then the an attacker would be able to get um, offline uh, password guessing. And with uh, uh, BSpeak, uh, it does add uh, some uh, another uh, pass back and forth, or well, one more trip, but. Um, it has an extra property that is uh, quantum annoying. Uh, it's just a name I came up with. I'm not really attached to it. But um, basically, uh, due to the hash to point blinding on uh, the, well, the, uh, the base function uh, uh, spake uh, S 2 plus ee, that it's based off of, uh, that blinding uh, prevents you, well, it requires you to uh, solve one DLP for every password guess. So, um, so with hash to point, um, what that does is it creates a point on the curve that you don't know what the, um, the, uh, the uh, discrete log is. So uh, when you are trying to attack this, you would have to guess a password, then hash it, it would go hash to point, then you would subtract it from the message that you saw that went by, and then you would have to solve the, uh, the DLP for what's left. And you'd have to do that every single time. First, other picks where you just have to solve one, and then you have everything that you need. There was one other thing with opaque. Uh, you don't need to observe a successful key exchange, but with uh, uh, bspake, um, you have to observe a successful key exchange to be able to then uh, use a quantum computer if it were to exist, uh, and you'd have to do one for every guess. Any further questions? <clears throat> All right, one last round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.